I'm going to open uh, this uh, session, Accelerating Coastal Community-Led Conservation, um, conservation uh, through gender inclusion in small scale fisheries as part of the fourth World Small Scale Fishery Congress, the session of the Asia Pacific. So I'm going now to, um, to present the agenda of the session. And while I'm presenting the agenda, I'm going to present uh, also the uh, speakers of our session. Um, the opening will be uh, done by uh, Maria Onig, who is the leader of the, she leads and coordinate the WWF initiative called Accelerating Coastal Community-Led Conservation, and which is a global effort on building resilience of coastal communities all around uh, the globe. After the opening, we are going to hear from two case studies, one from Pakistan and another one from India. In the, during these case studies, uh, we are going to have three uh, speakers who are uh, introducing and uh, providing a deep dive on the different case studies. The first one will be about a, a women network called Shiro from the Hindu uh, Delta in Pakistan. And the second case study, it is about how a coastal community uh, group of women are addressing ghost gears. In the first case studies, Jawad Umer Khan um, will introduce the session and um, a, a little bit of introduction of Jawad. Jawad is working as a coordinator in the marine program of WWF Pakistan, working on projects related to marine biodiversity, bycatch mitigation, sustainable fisheries and, and uh, habitat conservation and climate change. He has more than 12 years of professional experience in working with different agencies from both conservation, humanitarian development aspects. Then we are going to listen to a testimony from the field. And we are going to uh, listen to Zibo, who is part of the Shiro Network of Women. She's an active community woman and a small scale food producer. She was previously engaged in uh, clam fisheries, but after sharing, uh, joining the, the network, she actively plays her role to raise her community problems in front of the governmental officials on different platforms. After that, we are going to uh, hear from uh, uh, Sidafiza Shaha, who is currently working as a lecturer at the University of Sid. Campus Tata, and she's a gold medalist in MBA, and now has enrolled as a PhD in the University of uh, uh, Sid Jamashoro. But she's also working as a director of, of women empowerment at the Alif Institute of Learning and Leadership. And she's possessed seven years of experience as a trainer. After that, we are moving to the case studies of India. Vinod uh, Malai Letu is going to pre uh, present the case studies. Vinod is as a marine biologist with 30 years of experience on different uh, areas of marine conservation and sustainable management of fisheries and aquaculture. Now is coordinating the ocean and coastal programs of WWF India. He will be joined with, by Miss um, Sneha Prakasama, who is a marine biologist uh, with a, a master's degree from the James Cook University in Australia. And she's now the program coordinator uh, of the ocean programs uh, in India. And she's directly working with the coastal communities. So she's going to present uh, the specific case studies together with Dr. Velvihi, who is the head, she is the head of the Fish for All Research and Training Center at the Zwamamita Research Foundation, focusing on uh, sustainable fishing. She is working on and training uh, with uh, from uh, from different from uh, 20 years of services 
in many, many different uh, projects, and she is directly uh, working with the fishing communities. After those case studies, we are going to, uh, together with the participants, um, being part of facilitated discussion. And, uh, but we are going also to have time for question and answer. And then we are going to close uh, the session with a final remark. So with any uh, further ado, I'm going to pass the floor to Maria Honey to present the session. Thanks, Marina. And thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, this Asia Pacific fifth, Fourth World's Fourth Gear Fishery Congress. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating this session and very delighted to be sharing two very strong cases from India and Pakistan. But briefly, I think we should get our heads into why we're doing this work, why it's so important. Women in coastal communities are undervalued, and we need to recognize their role in meeting food security and nutritional needs. Globally, women's fishing activities amount to 3 million tons of marine fish and other seafood per year, with an estimated value of 5.6 billion US dollars per year about 12% of landed value of small-scale fishing catches. And in addition to these important roles in the small-scale fishing sector, involving women in decision-making around resource management and leadership can accelerate both conservation and climate adaptation outcomes for coastal communities, making them integral actors in coastal community resilience. However, Despite their importance to coastal societies around the world, and despite the increasing appreciation of this, the contributions of women in small scale fisheries around the world are still underreported and consequently look, overlooked in fisheries policy. We do know how to combat gender exclusivity in small scale fisheries. We need to strengthen small scale fisheries management and sustainable aquaculture and do so with women and men having equal seats at the table. This is a development imperative. Until now, the global advocacy, policy and funding community has been undervaluing the importance of women. This means we have missed the chance to advance progress on the SDGs and not just gender, but ending hunger and protecting life below, below water. This is also a climate imperative and gender sensitive approach to addressing climate adaptation will achieve more equitable and comprehensive results for nature and people. This is a resilience imperative. The little formal support in financing schemes available to women has only exacerbated the COVID-19 impact where responses and mitigation measures have tended to be either gender blind or overly representative of men's experiences. We need to ensure a social safety net exists out there for both men and women. This year is an important year. It is the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, and it's an important opportunity for us to showcase the potential and diversity of small-scale artisanal fishes and aquaculture and point to the benefits that can be gained from facilitating partnerships and cooperation with fishers, fish farmers, and fish workers in achieving all of the sustainable development goals. One of the key messages this year is to acknowledge the role of women and, how, and the role they play in small-scale artisanal fisheries and aquaculture value chains as being essential to women's empowerment in the sector. And today I have the great honor of sharing two case studies in India and Pakistan that demonstrate gender-inclusive solutions that are designed by women small-scale fishers committed practitioners and academics, and they are an important, socio-ecologically important context. Gives me great pleasure to hand over to our first speaker today, Mr. Jawad Khan from WWF Pakistan to introduce the Climate Shiro's Network from the Indus Delta in Pakistan. Thank you, Jawad, take the floor. Thank you so much, Maria, for the, such a nice uh, introduction and uh, uh, your description regarding the small scale fisheries and the, how the share is important. So I would request Lucia, if you can just share my presentation. 
regarding the climate shiro's network so uh, my name is jawad and uh, i am working as a coordinator in marine program of wwf pakistan uh, over the past few years and uh, in these those years we work along with a lot of communities uh, within the uh, provinces of sindh and balochistan so moving forward uh, i would request lucia to i have these are some of the contents that i would like to cover in the next couple of minutes in my presentation that includes the site introduction of the, where we actually uh, uh, making the network of the sheroes sheroes is basically the the female heroes which we call the sheroes of the climate who basically combat with the climate issues on a daily basis on their routine lives and after that we have some studies regarding their uh, to uh, see the vulnerabilities and how they are cope up with the uh, climatic issues and the adaptability of their uh, peoples and after that the network and then some of the awareness so these are some of the content that i will cover in my next few slides so first is the site introduction this is the site map where we are actually working it's basically the area of kharochan it's uh, in the sindh province and the coastline of approximately 350 kilometers overall coastline of pakistan is around 1100 kilometers comprising in two provinces that is sindh and balochistan in, but in the sindh we have one particular area that is kharochan in which we have some significant amount of crops and a fresh water flow for the mangroves but over the past past years these sites are facing the climatic changes around 70% of uh, the people that the community that residing in that uh, kharochan area they depend on the fisheries the small scale fisheries and the large scale fisheries and the other mode of income is the agriculture the community is well below the poverty line and they really re rely heavily on the environmental Im impacts the fresh water flow and the fish availability because uh, if uh, there were no raining they will not get the fresh water uh, and they will not get the good amount of fish that is associated with that thing so mangrove forest is also one of the component uh in kharochan there are around 10000 different livestock the camels and buffaloes and goats they mostly graze on the mangroves so the impact uh, of these climatic disasters is high on the community because the fresh water flow is declining due to the less amount of rain over the past years so uh, what are the actual impact that cause cause due to the less amount of rain is that they have the coastal erosion by sea intrusion and this sea intrusion made community more vulnerable towards flood and other natural disasters so this is a little introduction about the site uh, now i would request lucia to go on the next slide so after seeing these impacts that these hazards that they have less raining they have the climatic uh, impacts over the community because in the past years they have a very good production of red rice uh, and other sort of crops but due to climate change and less fresh water flow less raining they uh, most of the community face a lot of difficulties in gaining their livelihood so for uh, getting the actual uh, 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 the actual problems the community is facing we have conducted some of the studies the first study we conducted is the vulnerability risk assessment to identify the actual challenges and issues on the ground and on by seeing these vulnerability risk assessments we have developed two uh, local adaptation plan of actions as i mentioned earlier in my slide that there are two important sector one is fisheries and the other one is the agriculture so we have developed these local adaptation plan of action for both the sectors one for the fishery sector and other one is for the uh, agriculture sector but to look that what are the possible solutions that we can offer to the communities in order to mitigate the current climatic uh, changes that they are facing so the recommendations we get uh, by the team of the experts with these studies the loss and damage and the local adaptations plan of actions we get for the agriculture purpose we uh, agri for the agriculture because they have red rice production prior to the climate changes 
so we can uh, i'm just explaining a little bit about i know that is for the fishery sector i'm focusing on that later but just a background of these things that the the studies associated we have implemented uh two three models over that village uh, according to the studies like hydroponics or aquaponics but due to the high salinity and tds of the water because there is no fresh water flow we are unable to make this thing possible so we can move to the other option so we can find a white uh, rice or wild grass species of horiza that's the only species who is high salt high salt tolerant and community can easily grow in the coastline the benefit of that uh, crop is that it is actually the alternate fodder crop for the livestock as i mentioned that there are 10000 buffaloes and camels and goats in the community so they mostly graze on the mangroves and when they graze on the mangroves the community becomes highly vulnerable to towards the floods so we provide these uh, wild grass species to the community to feed these uh, grasses to their livestock so that we can able to conserve the mangroves and we are able to uh, eventually we are able to mitigate the risk of the climate the floods uh, for the community the other one is the uh, local adaptation plan of action for the fisheries sector and for that recommendation we see that uh, as due to the climate uh, climatic changes because most of the fishermen are small scale fishers they don't go to the offshore waters or not go beyond the 12 nautical miles or to the offshore water so they mostly do fishing in the narratic zone but they don't get the uh, good catch of the fisheries because there is less fresh water flow the population of mangrove is decreasing so they are not able to get the shrimps or the mud or the or the crabs from that particular area so uh, what we do we can provide them uh, a crab fattening pond structure for the crabs present over there so that they can fatten these crabs and they can sell these crabs on a very good rate in, in the local market and they able to uh, earn their livelihood even if there is no fish available so this is the second thing that we have done for the community and and the last but not least we uh, empower the women to establish the nurseries mangrove nurseries or uh, in, near to the coast uh, coast area because they are residing to the coastal area so they can establish the mangrove nurse, nursery so the people are able to buy the saplings from them and we also involve them in the plantation uh, of the mangrove so that they can get a good so they can earn a good livelihood from that uh, lucia kindly can you go to the next slide you have another minute time so what yeah lucia can you please go to the next slide yes yeah. so the our main topic is the climate sheroes so the aiming of forming the Shiro's network is to give prime importance to the women and to acknowledge the role of women in the community. As uh, in the uh, in the Karochan community, mostly the women are involved in the small scale fisheries. They involved in the razor clam fisheries and the crab fattening uh, uh, ponds or in the shrimp peeling. So women, along with men of the coastal areas, they also support their families. They actively participating in generating income. So they this they must be included in the decision making process. <coughs> but the previous practice is not the same because there are restrictions for the community women. They are not allowed to speak in front of the, the peoples, in front of the decision makers, or in front of the government officials. So what we do, we mobilize their community men that uh, and tell them the the role and importance of those women in the area. So after a lot of mobilization they allow these women to be the part of the uh, network that is the climate sheroes network in which uh, we uh, build the capacity of the climate women to make a strong network of shiro which is able to communicate with the government officials with the line departments for their rights and for their issues they are facing on ground and we disseminate their message on a wider scale. We include them. We all include them in our seminars and workshop. And our we have a very great network of the key stakeholders in which we have all the government officials or the uh, secretaries or the the, the 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 persons who are able to make decisions in the policy, so that we can take these community heroes in front of them to tell that what are the issues and challenges they are facing on ground. 
and for this purpose we also made a lot of uh, awareness raising materials because shiro's engagement and their uh, empowerment is very important the shiro's are showcasing their problems at local national and international level or oh, and uh, Uh, a lot of media the social media print electronic media in pakistan they cover their stories and they appreciate uh, the shiro's network at every forum because these are the women who previously are not able to speak in front of even their own husbands or uh, brothers or fathers but now they are able to speak in front of a lot of government officials and they know what are their rights and how they can uh, earn a good livelihood for their families so uh we made these uh, awareness raising materials uh, to uh, promote the shiros on a wi wider network we have a lot of uh, case studies or uh, awareness raising material and we shared these uh, material these studies these shiros campaigns with all the government officials the media the academia and all the other relevant organization you know these can easily be available in pdf versions as well and uh, disseminated uh, around the globe uh, even in the uh, mock climate summit or in the uh, climate summit of 2020 we can share these stories as well so what our aim is to promote our female heroes and the female hero is actually the shiro so our aim is to promote these sheroes all around the globe because our vision is uh our vision is to promote them from local to global and uh, we are uh, hopeful uh, that in hopefully in future these women that that are now become the part of the uh, these climate heroes network will act as a learning hub for other community women and the network is getting bigger and bigger uh, day by day so with this i am thankful because we have a very short uh, time to present this thing so and i request lucia to give floor to our female hero the shiro miss zebo so that she can share her thoughts that, that uh, uh, how she feels to be a member of the most amazing network in pakistan or in the coastal communities of pakistan so with this uh, i am concluding uh, my presentation uh, over to you marina thank you so much Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, please, uh, Zaibo, are you going to to present now with the support of Jawad? Yeah, Zaibo can uh, turn on her video. She has no PPT to share. Uh, she is our community hero. Yeah, okay. she can. Uh, Welcome, Zaibo. Please, can you speak? She's saying hi. Hi, Zebo. Munja nalo Zebo hai. Aum karo chhan de kare nandare bhot me randiye ya. Aay mujhe taalu ke jeko hai so machi maran je saaf hai mujhe gharwaro machi marin do yo. मुझे वोट जो साहली पट्टी के वेझो है मुझे गुजर वशर जो है धंधो वो मच्छी मारण से है पर मौसम की तब्दीली की वजह सेको है सो माहौलिया आलूदगी की वजह से मच्छी के शिकार में इलाई जो है सो तब्दीली अची वही है जैसी वजह से असो रोजगार भी मुतासर थे तो जैसी वजह से असो रोजगार तो थे पर डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ जी वा जो है सो शुक्र गुजार आयुँ जो उन औरत ग्रुप असो शीरोज जो नेटवर्क ठाया उन असो यो शीरोज जो नालो दिनो वो जैमें आऊँ मेम्बर आया हर महीने असि मीटिंग क्या उन में अस मायन जहा मसला दींदा आय 
असके सरकारी इदारा उन में असंदे गोठन के मसले के बारे में बुधाई Sorry Zebu continue Adi Zebu Acha Ki kaba ai je ko ai asa asa da shukar guzar hu asa ke wwf aran je ko ai so ekdo net thai dinu आगाही प्रोग्राम पालींदी डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ वन अस नंढा नंढा तलाब दिना जैसा असि जरूरत जिंदगी बेहतर थी वही है कुदरती माहौल में भी बेहतरी अची वही अस नंढन नंढन कूकन उन बच्चन के झली कर तलाब में विझंदा उन वो कर टे सौ पं सौ में उन व्यापार कदा हाँ असि जिंदगी बेहतर थी वही है मछली मछी का शिकार भी कह हाँ असो असो अस मायन के शीरो जो नालो दिनों वो हाँ अस मर्दन से गड बीहदा अस वा शुक्र गुजार आयू तो डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ वन अस भाइ्तियार बनाया है अस चाह अस चाहूँ त माहौल अस माहौल की बेहतरी के लिए असिया मुतबाद रोजगार दिना वन जी मजीद बेहतरी अची वन थैंक यू अति जेबो ती वी So now I'm translating that what Zebo has said. I'm writing that uh, along with what she's saying. So she said that hi everyone. Uh, are you able to hear me? Perfectly, Jawad. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Hi everyone. My name is Zebo, and I am re resident of a small village of Karochan. I belong to a fishing coastal community of Sin. Our livelihood is based on fishing, but due to climate change and environmental pollution, fish catch is reducing day by day. Due to which, not just our livelihood, but also social private life is affecting. I am very thankful to WWF due to their continuous efforts. So they have organized our women and formed a formal network of women, which we call Sheroes Network, derived from the word She Heroes. This group formally work for the benefit of our area and regularly conducts meetings in which we discuss our issues and challenges we faced within our surrounding due to the climate and try to resolve these issues following the suggestions provided by all members we are not restricted to our area but we have represented the sheroes network on different provincial and federal level forums being part of shero enable us to meet other sheroes from different areas we were amazed to see women like us who are also representing their areas and issues on different forums and they also work formally like an organization for the betterment of their lives and area our sheroes network have requested wwf to train us on grape farming wwf pakistan have addressed our request and conducted a training program on grape fattening and farming and how to earn by selling the grapes under this program we have established small pond for this purpose due to which we are fulfilling our economic requirement and also working for the betterment of the environment and community 
catching the small crabs and then fattening them in the pond for four to six months and then selling those crabs in a local market at good rates, which eventually enhance livelihood in the community. Another positive factor regarding crab pond is if the fish catch is low, we can still manage to earn by selling the crabs. We do not have to take loans, which was a general practice and extra burden on our limited income. Today, we Shiro's are working with men shoulder to shoulder. Further, we request WWF Pakistan and other organization, which has the resources and capacity to train us more on alternative livelihoods, environmental conservation and sustainable fisheries because this will lead to our better understanding and awareness to secure our future and empower us to combat climate change. So this thank is- Thank you, Jawad. Uh, thank you very much, Jawad, and thank you very much for uh, Zebu's testament to the work in the, in the country. And uh, I think we will now um, hand over to our next speaker, and we'll have some time towards the end for questions to Zebu and Jawad for the case in Pakistan and, and an opportunity for, um, for them both to talk through um, any questions that you might have towards the end of the session. So thank you. And now I hand over to Dr. Fizas Shah from University of Sindh, uh, who talk a little bit more about the Shiro's campaign for a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, for giving us such a platform to share so far the progress of uh, collaboration between WWF and University of Sen. I'm actually highly grateful to all the organization, organizers and uh, uh, my intro has already been given a bit more about me. Uh, this is Sayeda Fizasha. I'm working as lecturer at the uh, University of Sen and uh, my main motive is to just encourage you especially the youngsters to become active citizens and save uh, work for the environment and save the globe. <clears throat> Moving on towards the introduction of Sindh University. Uh, university of Sindh is the, uh, the oldest university of the country and it was constituted under the University of Sindh Act number 18 of 1947 that was passed by the Legislative Assembly of Sindh. The Act of 1972 under which the university is presently functioning provided for greater autonomy and representation of teachers. University of Sin uh, has eight major uh, campuses, amongst which University of Sin Campus Theta, which was registered in 2012, and started its first page from 2013. We uh, have very special department uh, that was launched or inaugurated in uh, December 8, uh, 2015 actually is an interdisciplinary education and research center for providing trained uh, human resource and research-based solutions related to coastal and deltic region of Pakistan. It is basically, uh, you know, based in uh, Tatta and the coastal areas. What was the purpose of the center is to strive for the improvement, management and socio-economic development of coastal community, fishery sector, mango vegetation, reduction of uh, rapidly changing ecosystem by seawater intrusion and climate change. Coming towards uh, WWF Pakistan and uh, University of Sin, basically the uh, role of academia, you can actually uh, Maria, uh, move on to the uh, next slide as well, but I've carried out some glimpses of uh, the work that uh, WWF Pakistan and uh, University of Sin has been doing so far. So role of academy in promoting climate uh, shiros, University of Sindh along with WWF Pakistan uh, promotes the vision of including community women in decision making process while uh, formulating a policy. We started our journey along with the WWF Pakistan I think four years back and uh, have been actively participating in different meetings, seminars that have been held by WWF at our university. WWF Pakistan sensitizes youth by raising awareness among uh, climate issues and uh, how the communities of Karuchan and Katipan will actively respond to climate change. Engaging youth in uh, plantation drives and field visits to raise awareness uh, regarding communities, vulnerabilities and adaptation. Basically, they formed a network of climate sheroes comprises of community women who are small scale food producers and they actively support their families and communities as you know, quoted by uh, Ms. Zebu. Uh, they actually are trying to uh, mitigate their climatic issues. 
prior to uh, reach out to community uh, it is actually the practice over here in uh, coastal bed that women are not allowed to participate in meetings due to their traditional and cultural barriers. But again, uh, I would recommend, I would uh, appreciate the effective mobilization of WWF and its team. And that has a lot, you know, community men to understand the value of uh, women work. And then they are now engaged in influencing, they are actually attending uh, events, seminars and workshops in order to, you know, sensitize the local community to collectively, you know, they can resolve climatic issues and they admit without uh, engagement of uh, women, it's definitely not possible. So they admitted that women along with the men of the coastal area support their families and actively participating in generating income now. So they must be included in the decision making process and should be able to speak up for their rights. And especially the issues they are facing uh, and what possible options or nature based solutions they have. Uh, the, all the uh, glimpses that you are going to see in this uh, presentation if Maria's uh, uh, you know changing the slides so you'll see that how we have worked with the uh, wwf pakistan uh, actually for that purpose a strong network of shiros as mentioned by uh, jawad we have formed and uh, i think we i should recommend it strongly because uh, uh, it should be uh, it should not be for a specific area it should be given to other coastal areas as well uh, again coming to the way forward by university of sin uh, hopefully i'm audible Yes, you are audible, Kaza. Thank you. So, Shin University has uh, ensured WWF Pakistan that will be keeping uh, you know, uh, full support uh, in the mission of WWF and will work to include all the climate heroes in vocational trainings. We'll plan to provide different capacity building trainings in future so that they can support heroes uh, uh, with the WWF. And again, it's, uh, it's uh, our mission to strive for the improvement, management, and socioeconomic development of the coastal community so that these females, uh, especially these ladies, uh, should feel empowered uh, in working for their rights. Uh, concluding my presentation, once again, thank you so much, uh, Pakistan, and uh, entire, uh, all of you for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fiza Shah from uh, the University of Sindh. And uh, it's great to see the platform that's been created through that, uh, that event. So thank you very much for sharing that overview. I think we now start our next case study based in India. And I will be handing over to Vinod Malayalietu from WWF India who is the Marine lead of the program introduced earlier, but will now take us through a bit of an introduction to the next case study. Thank you, Vinod, please take the floor. Yeah, th thank you, Maria. And thank you, Marina, for the great uh, bio of mine. And I am really happy to hear the word Shiro, basically mentioned by Pakistan. So it is like she, hero. So he here we haven't coined any term, but it's basically women. Uh, so firstly, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the globe. Uh, and I firstly thank the organizers to give us an opportunity to present this webinar, especially this topic, which is really pertinent now, as women empowerment is one of the key agendas of the government uh, in the developing world. And here we are, in fact, taking the opportunity as in a tropical country where women power is the greatest power which i believe when it comes to productive sector so in india uh, so can you please uh, share the presentation okay okay ne next slide please so as you see here the major fish producing countries like china and india the women women represent 21 percent and 24 percent of the fishers and fish farmers and mostly in india uh, which is a male dominated sector so it is like men who go out for fishing and just because of two reasons one it is very strenuous and second thing is just uh, a belief which i feel is also like believe when women go to see uh, go to sea for fishing it, it, it they pursue it like a bad omen so it is just 
uh, uh, disbelief uh, on which I, I think is a, is a disbelief. And then, uh, so women are mostly involved in the post harvest activities like selling the uh, seafood that has been harvested then in the processing industry. Uh, and what I also see is in the decision-making process, they are seldom represented. Uh, and also when it comes to resource management in particular. Yeah, next slide, please, Lucia. Okay, and then on these, basically my colleague Sneha and our partner with the uh, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Dr. Vailbury will elaborate on what I am just giving as an introduction. So uh, basically in the late uh, 90s, there was a boom of the shrimp processing industry. The aquaculture had a boom. So at that time, women were mainly engaged in the peeling shed. So there are these peeling sheds where in which the prawns are brought uh, and then the women are engaged in the peeling and the meat actually grows for the processing. And at the fish, fishing harbors and the landing centers, once the catch lands in the fishing harbor, unfortunately, I don't have a picture to show. Uh, so uh, you can see that there are like a lot of women who are involved in the sorting of the catch. And they also do uh, auctioning in certain uh, parts of the state where I reside and also in, 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 in parts of India. And you can also see uh, women selling fish in the wayside markets. <laughs> and also they are majorly engaged in the processing industry, basically in packaging and storing. And also in aquaculture, they are mainly involved in the preparation of the, the, the feed, uh, not the ones which comes from the factory. So there are feeds which are made at site and also managing ponds like cleaning the buns and uh, de-weeding the grass on the bun. So these type of labor intensive activity are mainly by the women. Yeah, next slide, next slide, please. So here it's like just a very short video. So if time permits, uh, can we play this? Yeah, thank you. Hello, yeah, okay. There's no I, I, volume, uh, Lucia. I think you might have to reshare with volume. And there's no volume. Uh, okay, yeah. So, Is the audio not working? Unfortunately Sorry? not, you might have to reshare with, uh, with the Zoom um, to optimize sound. Reshare the presentation with Zoom to optimize sound as an option. Let me see. See if that's possible. Do we have time or is it over the schedule? So this video basically gives us an idea of the role of women uh, in India. Yeah. Fishing go. is generally perceived as a male-dominated industry. However, women play an essential role in the fishery sector. They are a critical labor force, both pre- and post-harvest, and the backbone of seafood processing plants. Women have been absent from formal decision-making platforms in the industry, making it challenging to address their livelihoods and well-being. WWF India through Fish Forward 2 is bringing out the involvement of women in the fishing sector and building support for equal opportunities, rights and participation of all employed by the industry. We are working with fishing communities to ensure that women are represented and heard in regulatory and policy making processes. Our short film on Rekha, one of the only licensed Deep Sea Fisher Women in India was well received and even screened at Bichel du Monde 2020. Our efforts have seen the increased participation of women self-help groups and representatives of Fisher Women's Associations in stakeholder meetings for awareness on sustainable fisheries management. 
we hope to see indian fisheries offer fair working conditions and equal opportunities for men and women yeah so yeah uh, thank Fishing you is gently yeah. perceived so uh, sorry next next slide please okay great so i think that short video gave us an idea of the role of women in the fishing sector and the fish forward 2 which was basically a project to uh, and one of the major ob objectives of the fish forward 2 project was uh, creating gender awareness and here what you see in the photos part of the fish forward 2 project where we had consultations with women to in order to understand their role in the seafood industry and also to see that their voices are heard uh, so with this, I invite Sneha for the presentation of the case studies. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, you know, um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Am I audible well enough? Just one second. Perfect. We can hear yeah. you well, Sneha. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah. Can the presentation be shared, please? Yes, just one minute, Sneha, please. While we're waiting, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we can ask questions to the speakers uh, after both case studies are presented. You can also send your questions in the chat. Okay, Sneha, there you go. Thank you. So I would like to present uh, the work that we've been doing in India uh, with post care upcycling involving the women from the fisher communities. Uh, so that would, so I would call it uh, disentangling the ghost one net at a time, and you'll understand why. Next slide, please. Right. So it's an established fact and a well documented one as well that plastics in the marine ecosystem has been uh, having a harmful effect on the marine life. And now that it's become more alarming that uh, ghost care is also becoming a threat, an increasing threat to marine life. Uh, fishing in India is the major industry employing 14.5 million people uh, around the clock. And India contributes to 7.7% uh, to the global fish production. And the country ranks fourth in the global um, exports of fish products. So with a magnitude this big uh, of fishing operations around the clock in the coastal uh, waters of India, it's bound to, uh, it's a, it's bound that uh, ghost care does today and uh, nets are often uh, entangled uh, with marine life and they're also lost or abandoned or, you know, discarded at sea. So uh, WWF India has been working in partnership with uh, local communities, government agencies, and the coastal groups to manage the marine debris, uh, plastic debris in the coastal waters, and also having a focus on goose care specifically uh, now. Uh, we've been working with the women fisher communities in um, Kavarati, Agati, and Andhra Islands as part of the Lakshadweep Patol, and uh, also in Vishakhapatnam, which is uh, a district in um, southern state of Andhra Pradesh in India. Uh, and this, all these have been uh, pilot case uh, studies so that we can you know, also learn from this and also extend this to other coastal states of India. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, can I get the next slide on? Uh, yes, I think it's just loading. It's the workshop, right? Yes. It's already, yes. yeah, just yeah, a second. Okay. I think it's loading. All right. Um, so um, uh, I will talk about the workshops that we've been uh, doing in the luxury violence. Uh, so we've had... Um, you know, experts, design experts on board with us for this particular workshop, uh, where um, we've uh, finalized products uh, by incorporating uh, ghost care uh, in uh, in craft or in um, you know small trinkets, etc. And uh, we've uh, done this workshop in March in uh, Andhra Thailand of Lakshadweep Patol, where we've had about uh, 20 uh, women from the community participate and uh, go through us uh, during the whole of 10 days. Next, please. So here are glimpses from the workshop. You can see women uh, having a hands-on experience with working with, uh, you know, fish fishing net, 
and uh, we've had uh, the design experts uh, take them uh, through uh, weaving techniques over lap looms and you can see uh, people participating and you can also see uh, people um, like the women doing them by themselves once they've learned the technique and also an illustration on, on the left where you can see uh, work in progress. Next, please. So these are some initial, uh, you know, outputs from the workshop. So once they've gotten hang of the technique and how, you know, you can uh, also innovate and you can use your own designs on, on the lap room. So these are, you know, the initial um, outputs of the um, workshops and they are yet to come. Like every day we have these WhatsApp groups where we have one new design from uh, a woman and one new product coming in uh, from somebody else. So it's it's a very uh, enthusiastic group and they've actively been taking it up uh, by themselves as well after we've left uh, the place. Next please. And you can see the happy faces here. So this is on the last day uh, of the workshop and you can see, you know, everybody having their own lap rooms with a unique design to themselves. And we've given them and we've had activities where they came up with their own designs and like also maybe something, a new technique that they would want to explore, you know, apart from we uh, teaching them, uh, you know, how to be on a lap room. So they've come up with their own uh, products and their, their own techniques. And they've also been practicing them um, over time. Next, please. Uh, apart from doing these workshops uh, on the island, we've also done uh, a similar workshop uh, on uh, mainland India in a state called uh, Andhra Pradesh and specifically in Vishakhapatnam. Uh, so we've done this in collaboration with a local NGO, which is called the Green Waves uh, Environmental Solution. So they primarily uh, work on recycling plastic and uh, e-waste. So they've already been in the field and they've already, uh, you know, they're trying to, you know, recycle plastic and also spread uh, awareness to general public on why plastic is, uh, you know, harmful for the marine environment. So we've gotten in touch with them and we've collaborated with them uh, to conduct these workshops with the women uh, from the fishing hamlets uh, around uh, the fishing harbor in Shakapatnam. Uh, so we've completed three successful um, there's a, a workshops um, and where we've had attendance from 100 women uh, from uh, across the workshops. And the women were shown uh, short videos on how the ghost care impacts uh, marine life and how uh, ghost care can be retrieved and can be used in uh, making products uh, in fashion industry or you know, textiles or any utility products. And um, during every workshop, one to two products are uh, taught and they're, they're developed from the, the women. And they're showcased at the end of the workshop. And you know, it's like a uh, achievement for them that they've completed a product and you can, they can also take it back to their um, houses and show their families as well. Next, please. So these are again a couple of products uh, from the workshops in um, Andhra. Uh, you can see a great difference from the kind of products that they've been doing in um, Lakshadweep uh, as opposed to Andhra. So in Andhra Pradesh, they were more of like you know fashion because you know women were more interested in making small bags out of it. You know they are uh, pen stand holders, and you can also see some keychains uh, on the table here. So all of these. Um, you know, were made by the women uh, with, you know, with their own hands and like, you know, using the fishing net, you can see the bags wrapped in fishing net. So that's also like a fashion statement and they're, you know, very proud with, you know, taking one home and showing it to their, um, you know, families. Next, please. So after every workshop, we have a 
a short discussion on what they've learned in the workshop and um, you know their enthusiasm to even uh, reciprocate this over time you know even when we are not around i mean we'll definitely be handholding them and we have our local uh, field teams you know visiting the women uh, often and like knowing if they need any help giving them products giving them uh, material to work on uh, in their free time so we we'll have discussions on you know how they felt about the workshop and would they help us in scaling them up so from on every workshops we have master trainers who train the uh, women uh, in the next workshop so it's not just you know the, the work's not done in that in that workshop alone you know we have women also coming back and then participating with us and them training other women so it's like a women self help groups that we've also been developing uh, that uh, help us in upcycling this care or at least know the uh, you know know that those care is a problem and we need to do something about it and they will also communicate this message hopefully to their um, you know husbands back home who go fishing uh, on a daily basis next please Uh, so going forward, um, we definitely would like to uh, scale these up to other coastal uh, states of India and have these workshops all across the coastal states of India where we have women participating and uh, you know they they feel like you know they're being included in something of their own as well, not just uh, you know recognized as you know a fishing family where the husband or the the man is the breadwinner of the family. So they also have a contribution. They also can uh, help us in making products. Which will ultimately, you know, get them a revenue of their own. You know, have an alternative uh, income source in the family, uh, and tell them that you know companies and uh, you know other corporates are now, you know, getting big in the field, and there is definitely a scope if these products can be streamlined. And you know, we also uh, would like to assist the government agencies to streamline this process and to institutionalize, uh, you know, uh, recycling and upcycling. You know, ghost care um, in uh, in these states, and definitely have women uh, be part of the, these groups, and uh, you know, feel empowered that you know that they, they are not just you know selling fish. They can definitely do something more with you know fishing nets and something which they can resonate with in their field. And we would definitely like to work with uh, consultants and uh, other NGOs and startups that are uh, in the field right now to build a business model. Uh, and telling uh, that and having a storyline to these products that are developed that hit the market so that the customers are also um, satisfied that they've been contributing to a good cause in like reducing ghost care in uh, the marine environment and not everybody is aware of what ghost care or ghost fishing is whereas now they can be they buy the product and they also have that satisfaction uh, level and we would definitely like to have women uh, be a voice in policy making also when it comes to managing marine plastic Plastics and uh, having sustainable fisheries. Yeah, next please. So I would like to leave you with one good picture from the field where you know all of them are happy. They've done it's the end of the workshop, and these are the products laid on the table where you know they work continuously since morning, just having maybe some cups of tea. Um, and um, yeah, so I would like to uh, end my presentation and pass it on uh, to my. Uh, other colleague on the team who will be presenting soon. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Sneha. We'll hand over to your colleague uh, to present and finally present the part, last part of this case. Ms. Valvizi, Head of Fish for All Research and Training Center in Swami Natan Research Foundation. Please take the floor. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, opportunity. So being the member of the small scale Fisher family, I am proud to participate in the important uh, conference. And now, and now I am going to share the work experiences of MS Swaminathan Research Foundation in addressing the, some of the key women issues in small scale fishery sector. Next slide, please. Uh, in uh, this is uh, the background of uh, the uh, small scale fishery sector. Uh, 
actually one of my colleague uh, the from pakistan uh, jibu jibu uh, she was highlighted about the uh, the struggles of uh, the small scale fishery sector uh, actually in india there are uh, 81 percentage of the total fishery sector comes under uh, small scale uh, fisheries uh, it is a kind of uh, community based uh, activity uh, the communities the, the people the communities involved in small scale fisheries have good understanding of the resources actually these understandings and knowledge skills are uh, uh, passed on from generation to generations mostly uh, uh, these people are linked with the local market uh, uh, networks they sell their products locally and they are highly dependent on middlemen for their uh, input and uh, uh, the women are uh, the integral part of the small scale uh, fishery uh, actually, this particular uh, uh, group, uh, the sector, uh, directly and indirectly uh, helps to the food and nutrition uh, security of the uh, dependent households. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, like uh, any other civilization, the, the fishing society, the fishermen and women society is guided by uh, certain traditions, uh, cultures and beliefs, uh, which both men and women adhere, defining the roles they play. Uh, this can be seen in the decision uh, uh, division of labor, where men uh, uh, seen in fishing at sea, while uh, the women work at the shore or uh, land. In the case of a small scale fishery sector, uh, the women are present in almost in all the, uh, the fisheries value chain, uh, start from uh, pre-harvest, harvest and post-harvest performing activities. Uh, across uh, east and west coast of uh, India, women involvement in carrying out fishing activities near the shore, lakes, river uh, is very prominent. And in, in backwater area also, uh, the middle-aged women are uh, catching shrimp uh, with their bare hand in muddy uh, waters. The post-harvesting is uh, their player dominant role. Uh, they are actively involved in uh, cleaning, processing activities. The, the transport is another major role uh, in small-scale fisheries. Uh, the women are uh, taking a dominant role. So they are uh, transporting both the fresh and dried fishes to the uh, nearby markets, uh, either by headloading or by tricycle lorries and using uh, other trucks. Then marketing, actually the marketing also, the women are actively involved in uh, Two way one is a structured marketing so they market that produces in the retail and wholesale markets near to the locations and in unstructured way also they are selling their products through street vending and door to uh, vendings next slide please Uh, the small scale uh, fisheries are uh, now undergoing many issues and uh, challenges. Uh, 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 actually, um, uh, in the capture fisheries, uh, you all aware of that uh, the overfishing and the depletion of uh, fish resources in the near shore waters uh, compel the compel the fishermen now uh, moving beyond their territorial waters. And uh, the issues like uh, the critical ecosystem, degradation of critical ecosystems such as seaweed, seagrass, coral reefs, which all affects the, uh, affects the small scale fisheries in many ways. And the increased pollution in near shore areas, which is, which is also one of the major issues faced by the small scale fishes. And due to the introduction of new gears uh, in recent times, uh, uh, there was a, a conflict among conflict between different uh, resource user groups uh, uh, in operating uh, nets in 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, places also they are facing a lot of issues and of course the climate change is uh, one of the important issues and uh, 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 the increasing number of uh, uh, the disaster like cyclones uh, not only the increasing in number uh, the increasing in the intensity is also affects the small scale fishes in many ways then coming to the uh, the uh, the and uh, landing center level, uh, the lack of facilities at the landing center, especially the storage and cleaning of fish and the landing center, which is also major issues faced by the women. Uh, the previously, the women were involved in uh, uh, small scale marketing and uh, vending, yeah, but in the recent times, uh, uh, due to the entry of large scale uh, 
players in fish marketing. The fishery sector is shifting towards uh, being more commercial and export oriented. As a result, uh, the women are totally marginalized uh, and the bulk of benefits are siphoned off by the middlemen. And the transportation of uh, fish is a huge challenge uh, for women uh, because uh, they don't have any, uh, uh, any uh, facilities to transport the fish from the fish landing center to the marketplace. So this is mainly, uh, and the, 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 trans, the bus, buses and lorries, they are hesitant to carry the fish in the market because of it's mainly due to the water and water that drips from the basket. And carry fish baskets on the head, uh, walk long distance in, uh, uh, is a laborious task for women. Uh, this leads to serious uh, health issues for them. Next slide, please. So uh, in order to address some of uh, the challenges faced by the women in small scale fisheries, uh, MSSRF has, uh, uh, has been involved in, uh, in some of the, uh, developing some of the uh, sustainable livelihood models uh, uh, through capacity building to the women with the forward and the backward linkages. Uh, this is one such model, actually promoting the collectives uh, for uh, dry fish processing and marketing, mobilize the women into the groups and uh, uh, all the groups in, uh, into federation. So these federation taking care of the dry fish pro processing activities. And uh, the capacity strengthening is one of the major aspect, uh, not only for the production techniques, the quality control is also uh, one of the important thing we have to do that with uh, all the certification uh, process. Uh, okay, uh, institution building, capacity strengthening, and then the infrastructure that is also very, very important to develop, to create, to develop a quality fish products. So for that purpose, the infrastructures like uh, fish drying yards, then a solar unit, those kind of things established and uh, also promote the knowledge on uh, the FAO code of uh, practice on fish and fishery products. These all uh, inputs uh, leads to a greater outcome. Uh, the women are actively participating in the process and this active participation lead to the empowerment of the women and they also earned uh, good income from this enterprise and uh, uh, because of the income they earn, they greater control over the income, resulting in uh, their spending money on the food of the food uh, uh, expenditure of the family and uh, taking care of the uh, health uh, care of the children. So, and thus this improved the nutritional outcomes of the family. So, overall, uh, the uh, the improve the health care of the family. This is one uh, uh, case. Then, second one. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is another uh, important uh, thing is that the valley addition, valley addition, uh, uh, actually in the coastal areas, uh, this malnourishment is a major uh, issue, so especially among uh, women and children. So to increase the diet diversity at the household level, uh, develop many, develop and demonstrate many uh, culturally acceptable, because it is very, very uh, important one and context specific, it's not uh, common for all the, the places, a context specific one. And and we developed, uh, promote, promoted many uh, uh, value-added products like uh, fish powders from anchovies, silver bellies, and small prawns like that. Then pickles, pickles from different species, uh, uh, even from dry fish and clams, so those kind of things. Then chutneys, papers. So a lot of fish products, more than 152 uh, more such value-added products are demonstrated. And uh, the women, uh, the uh, women take this one, this as a, uh, this is one of the entrepreneurial activity, not only for the uh, for addressing the household food security, they're also treating these activities as an entrepreneurial activity and they earn more uh, income. Next one, please. Yeah, uh, for, uh, for, for fresh fish trade, uh, one of the major, I already highlighted that uh, uh, the restriction of the women, uh, uh, women, the transport, uh, lack of transport facility from the landing center to the uh, urban markets, a major challenge here. So in order to address the issue, uh, we have created a network uh, between the uh, uh, local fish, fish vending women and the marketers available in the urban areas like Coimbatore and other uh, in major cities 
is in uh, Tamil Nadu and other uh, uh, southern states in India. So these network works very well and uh, 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 the women produce a fresh product, uh, fresh uh, ready to cook products uh, and uh, the marketers, they come to the landing center and uh, they take the product to the urban markets. So because of this kind of uh, linkage and tripod agreement uh, uh, between the uh, village community and the marketers, uh, the, uh, the quality fish available for all uh, 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 people in the urban areas with the affordable cost is one advantage. Then another thing is that the women get more employment opportunities, especially the women fish vendors, they get more employment opportunities and they earn more income. And uh, important thing is that they get uh, ready cash from the marketers. So they are free from money lenders. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another uh, another model, uh, livelihood model you know, promoted in the coastal areas, especially with the small scale fisher families, the promoting the small scale aquaculture, you know, the one of the major issues due to sea level rise, although the coastal areas are uh, salinated, the agriculture not possible because of high salinity. So uh, we have converted the saline affected area into productive land. So integrate uh, fish with uh, uh, salt and uh, uh, flood tolerant the crop varieties. Uh, one is the integrated fish farming system uh, and wherever wetland is available, mangroves are available, we integrate mangroves with uh, fisheries. So this approach uh, uh, leads to good income for the fam uh, family and the women actively involved in the processing, it is a near shore area and it is also one of the, they, they treat this activity as a family farming activity. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the because of this, uh, the productivity is also increased and the waste from one subsystem is uh, built from the another system so the the waste is recycled and uh, they also get income there's one the... one minute re remaining yeah. miss yeah, yeah. next one please next slide please yeah, based on this uh, implementation and uh, uh, the models, uh, what our learning is that uh, uh, when we work with the community, we have the science-based, community-centered and process-oriented approach is very much needed for successful uh, coastal resource management and the livelihood enhancement of the coastal community. And uh, uh, the network among the uh, community government NGO is very, very important. We should work together to bring success uh, and should be uh, 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 longer uh, the initiative. And uh, uh, when we talk about the conservation, normally we missed the livelihood concerns of the people. But uh, our learning source that the concurrent attention to the livelihood concerns of the people is uh, very, very important to sustain our conservation and management efforts. Uh, uh, and also the community take ownership of the uh, interventions. Uh, this is our key learnings from this note I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Valvezi, and thank you to all that an enormously good partnership that's happening in India to portray the great work of, um, of that of that those sites. And I'm I'm really I've, I have to say that the presentations were absolutely excellent today by all of our speakers. So I, I, I have to send an enormous thank you to all those. And now we have an, an opportunity just for seven minutes to have a little uh, panel discussion between ourselves and the, and the speakers. Uh, as we don't have any questions from our audience, I still invite you to participate by throwing a question in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to start off a question. Since we've got limited time, I'm going to pose a question to everyone uh, who joined us here today. What is the biggest take home from your experience from today's session that you believe would be a solution that could be scaled up in your country? What is the, what from today's session do you think is an incredibly important take home message uh, to be scaled up? in your countries. And I actually pose this question to everyone openly uh, since there's limited time and we just want to hear from everyone briefly. That's okay. Yeah, Who's can first I to answer the question? Yeah. Go ahead, Thank you. Yeah, um, 
as i mentioned uh, during my presentation that we have established a very strong network of uh, the key stakeholders uh, that include the high level government officials uh, in which we have the officials from all the departments that are associated with the climate or the uh, related to other issues of the person the, the the people's like the forest department the wildlife the uh, maritime affairs department so we have made a very strong network and we call this network that's another network we call this network as a forum of environmental experts and we continuously uh, tell them regarding the shiro's network the activities that the shiro's are doing what are the studies we are doing in order to make these recommendations a part of the policies so because they are basically they are the persons who are uh, playing a vital role in the decision making process uh, decision making process so the scale of factor is there they uh, are already appreciating the shiro's network they already uh, are well aware of the studies that we are doing on the coastal areas of sindh and balochistan and they committed uh, to make these things a part of the policy and they requested us to uh, give them some more ideas regarding uh, uh, make uh, these uh, network uh, to give us more ideas uh, related to that network so that uh, we can able to uh, draft a policy for uh, in the uh, in the coming years and uh, the lesson i get today from the vinod sineha and velvezi presentation these are the work these guys are doing are absolutely amazing because in pakistan we the, the most of the fisheries of india and pakistan is same but uh, we also have a lot of ghost gears the abandoned lost and discarded fishing gears over the coastal areas and within the sea we can uh, involved in a lot of projects in which we are involved in collecting those gears and we try to recycle some things from that but the recycling idea we get from the senia are very much Uh, appreciable and we definitely will implement try to implement get these uh, ideas from more, more details on these ideas with the sneha and we will uh, try to replicate those ideas with our climate heroes as well our climate heroes are already involved in making handy crafts and different sort of crafts they we give them training on sewing or some sort of beautician training so that they can earn their livelihood but the craft they are making with the ghost gear it's definitely a very best nature based solution we uh, which we would like to replicate in our country another thing is that the well in the velvezi presentation the the way they are uh, sorry i know i'm taking a, a little more time just give me a last minute i know that uh, uh, velvezi i just need one question from you that how as you said that Uh, we already know that fish is a very uh, high in protein and uh, they can uh, resolve the problem of the uh, malnutrition but how you made these products more uh, sustainable or uh, more prolonging so the, the and how the community is it easily available for the community and you can sell them on a very yeah. low cost or, uh, i mean to ask that how this can benefit the community women the products that you are making thank you joa thought... thank you thank you very much i want to hand over to another speaker to consider the of what was learned here today for strengthening women's empowerment and uh, raising the voices of women in terms of solutions better than india and pakistan what's another um bit of feedback on scaling up those solutions in country does somebody want to take the floor to answer that question as well from our speakers uh gazi from the audience raise her his hand oh great gazi please go ahead not sure if the if there if the participants can speak maybe just pop your question in the chat there gazi uh would be easiest I hand over to uh, one of the speakers in in the uh, India case perhaps speak to the idea of scaling up the solutions in India and what you learned here today Okay Maria I can I mean sorry Gazi is in Yeah uh yes uh, 
I just want to add one thing that uh, uh, the ghost gear Z cycling uh, and also the ideas of crab fattenings as described by Sneha and uh, Jawad, uh, they are wonderful. However, I just, I would like uh, that these efforts should be projected, uh, pro should be projected and given wide publicity because we have to see how we can influence the decision making which is, as you see that, which is normally dominated by men in our region and in developing countries. So due to this cultural and social norms, the gender, social and cultural norms normally may uh, impact the way communities innovate, innovate the ideas and introduce new things and adapt to the changes uh, that address some of the increasing pressure on fishing resources. So. The best thing for scaling up and for uh, that, we have to see how best we can integrate it in the overall decision-making process because we believe that out of sight, out, uh, out of mind. So we have to keep in sight the uh, uh, women gender's contribution, uh, contribution. That's what I want to suggest. Thank you, Gazi. Okay, in our final minute, I think I'm going to hand over to one of the speakers from India, Case. Yeah, thank you, uh, Maria. So my biggest takeaway from this workshop is basically networking, skill development, and building of a business model, which would definitely empower, can you hear me? Perfectly, Vinod. Yeah, we, we should def definitely empower the women uh, for entrepreneurship building. And as a scaling up the pilot model, which we have done in Lakshadweep, basically the upcycling of the ghost gear, that pilot model can also be replicated in the mainland, which we are currently envisaging through a different project. So one, since the pilot model has worked in Lakshadweep, we will be scaling up to other four coastal states in India uh, and also uh, like big industries, automobile industries and even plastic manufacturers are in fact interested in uh, the upcycling of the ghost gear. So basically for the automobile industry, the Ford is a company which now uh, they manufacture the nuts and bolts using uh, recycled ghost gear, which is a very good opportunity for upcycling ghost gear. And there is another company called DSM, which is a huge company, which also manufactures surfboards and several other plastic, uh, plastic related components. And they are also interested in sourcing the ghost gear from the community. So these are like entrepreneurship, or business models which can be replicated in other parts of the world as well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vinod. Okay, and I think maybe we hand over to one of the uh, women speakers in either India and Pakistan to close a session with a final thought on, uh, on the solutions that were presented today. Who would like to speak, Sneha or Ms. Valvizi yeah, I can... or Zibu? Maybe I can um, just add a few of my thoughts and maybe we can close. Thanks, Neha. Please go ahead. Yeah, so um, it's, it's first of all, it's amazing what Pakistan has been doing uh, to create such a large network of women um, all coming together and um, participating and also uh, interacting with each other. So I think we're just um, taking initial steps in doing that in India. And we've already seen a uh, great response from the women here. And we definitely would like to take it up to other coastal uh, states of India as well and scale it up further and also have um, basically also mediate between maybe um, other companies that are in the field currently using plastic in their products and the women uh, network and the women um, groups uh, across these states uh, and act as a mediating uh, member where we can uh, have like a supply chain of women uh, doing those products and the companies taking them to the market or like in improvising on that and taking it to the market. So uh, that's like our end goal and that's what we envision from our efforts in India here. And uh, yeah, we hope to see great results going forward. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sneha. Yeah, my uh, takeaway from this workshop is that two point. One is the networking is very uh, important. Then second thing is that uh, the community centered. Actually, when we implement any uh, kind of uh, uh, sustainable fisheries or gender related work at the field level, the local community is the key partner, and they play a major role in decision making. So we have to involve them in a correct way to get a better uh, results. This is one thing. Then second thing is that uh, uh, the process oriented approach. Uh, uh, actually, when we involve them in the process, uh, it consists of theory soft steps which accommodate changes in their perception, changes in the problems and priorities of stakeholders. We, all those things uh, accommodate in our decision making process. Then only we will get uh, good uh, uh, results. This is my takeaway from this workshop. I think I would like to add something too. Please, go ahead. Uh, actually, we, uh, we can address the gaps uh, and challenges. There's a, a dire need that we need to link government officials and other community members together so that you know, we, we can raise their voices and at mass level. And we need to involve uh, more youth. And I think uh, there's a need to add academia and media so that uh, you know, we need to look into the mitigation options for communities uh, that are being affected with the climate change. And again, uh, by forming uh, more sustainable issues networks, their voices can be heard by the masses. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Z and would Zebu like to say anything? She if she would like to, and then Jawad perhaps translate. I believe it completely and entirely up to her, but it's also okay if she doesn't feel she has more to say. But it would be great to hear from Zebu. Oh, I think there is some network issue. She is unable to hear my voice because she is not responding. Okay, thank you, Joel. If she is not responding, no. my colleague would respond. Okay. Well, while we give her a moment uh, to, to connect there, I just want to say another massive round of thank you to all of the speakers here today. The two models were extremely impressive with uh, very, very clear results for both people in nature, but most significantly for women, uh, small-scale fishers and, and uh, the, main, the main providers in some of those coastal communities. So I think I'm just gonna finish with some closing remarks and some closing thoughts of the session, unless Zebu has one last thing she's able, is she able to connect and would like to say something? Okay, not a problem. I think we close because we are well over time We've been lucky to be given an extra couple of minutes here to finish nicely. I'll start by saying what I heard today is that everyone has a role to play from governments, the private sector to the general public, youth, and especially coastal communities. We need to work together in a world in which particularly women small scale fishers are fully recognized um, for their important role and are continuously empowered to contribute in that role for small scale fisheries. And I would just like to say that some of the things I heard today were, there are solutions, they're around the world and we have them at our fingertips and innovation is not critical. Now is the time to scale on those innovations. We are trying to fill gaps. We're trying to complete research we're trying to strengthen capacity and we're trying to strengthen networks of women in those particular instances that'll have an opportunity to bring their voices to the table. And I see Zibu is available again to connect with us. Please, Zibu, go ahead. You have some yeah. final remarks. Uh, she's just saying that thank you all of you for providing us the opportunity to spoke in, uh, in a bigger forum like this. So she is quite happy to be the participant or be the panelist of this group. Thank you. And thank you, Jawad and Zibu, for arranging her time with us to give us a testimony. 
And uh, to close, I just want to say that uh, this is the year of the artisanal small scale fisher and aquaculture. There'll be many more events like these and we want to continue to promote um, access, rights, tenure for women, small scale fishers and small scale fisheries if we want to see solutions for both men and women and having them both having equal seat at the table going forward. So a great thank you to India and Pakistan and uh, let's continue the great work together. Signing off, all the best to all.